Okay, we are back and now we have a nice picture on our um, screen. So let's pretend. Let us pretend that you are considering attending the University of, Wa uh, sorry, the Eastern Washington University and you have um, been um, accompanying like a tour around campus and checking out the dorms and the, you know, dining hall and the library and everything. And then you're being shown all the recreation areas. And as you go through the weight room area, you come upon these three students using the um, weight equipment and stuff. And your tour guide says to you, oh, here are some of our students now. Um, and the tour guide asks the group, do you think that these students are more likely to be honor students or that they're more likely to be honor students who play football? Kind of a random question for a tour guide to ask, but let's just pretend. So what would you say if you were in the gym, you see these three guys working out and your tour guide asked you, are these students more likely to be honor students or these are honor students who play football? So you're looking at the picture and I think you're probably thinking what my students often say in class, which they're like, well, I mean, they look like football players. So I guess they could be football players who are honor students, I guess. They definitely look like football players, but that wasn't one of the choices, just football players by themselves, right? It was honor student or honor play students who play football. Well, let's look at this through a probabilistic lens. Let's imagine that this circle represents all the Eastern Washington University students who are honor students. And let's say that this circle represents all the Eastern Washington students who are football players. Um, please note these circles are not drawn to scale or anything that's in, meant to imply anything except for that there's probably more honor students on campus than there are football players on campus. And that there's some amount of overlap where some of the football players are honor students, some of the honor students are football players. Okay. Probabilistically, we should not guess that they are in that tiny sliver as illustrated by this picture. They sh we should not assume that they are two things, that they are both of the, that little tiny overlap. We are gonna be much safer if we only get to pick from their honor students or they are honor students who play football. We have a much better chance of being correct if we assume that they are one thing rather than that they are the conjunction of two things. Right, it's much more likely that they're in that big circle called EWU honor students than it is that they're in that little um, sliver where the two circles are overlapping each other. So why is it so likely that when we look at this picture and I give you this scenario, um, we say, well, I guess they can be honor students too, but they definitely are football players. So I'll say honor students who are, are football players. Why are we willing to make that mistake? Um, because of something called the representativeness heuristic. Because the scenario so clearly represents football player, they so clearly represent our prototype for football player that we say, I guess they could be something else too, but they're definitely football players. And so we're willing to overlook the probability that they are the combination of two things in favor of our emphasis on how representative they are of the secondary thing, right? The football player. It's a really common error, right? Like if a person has a characteristic that matches our prototype, we assume that they belong in that concept, right? So if they, if they're, if they're fitting it well enough, we will, we will forget about the probabilities and we'll just go right with how well they represent the group. So if it represents our prototype, we assume it's a member of the category. So in this case, the it's our people, but you know what I mean. If it represents our prototype, we assume it's a member of the category. Okay. Now just FYI, I pulled this picture off of um, the Spokesman Review, and these are actual some Eastern Washington University football players from a few years ago. And so I'm not just stereotyping and saying that people wearing football shirts and in the gym are football players. These really are football players. Okay. Because um, right, the representativeness heuristic sounds a lot like stereotyping, right? And so if, if the 
case in front of us represents our prototype well enough, if it matches our prototype well enough, we're willing to assume that they belong to the category. All right. Dr. Swinkle's cousin Rudy is a bit on the peculiar side. He has unusual tastes in mo movies and art. He is married to a performer and he has tattoos on various parts of his body. In his spare time, Rudy takes yoga classes and likes to collect old 78 RPM records. An outgoing and rather boisterous person, he has been known to act on a dare on more than one occasion. What do you think Rudy's occupation most likely is? Farmer, librarian, trapeze artist, lawyer, or doctor? Okay, well, I've got you a little bit um, gun shy because I just explained to you about the representativeness heuristic. So hopefully you're all saying, well, I mean, I guess he could be, I don't know, a doctor or something, right? Um, because I've, I just got done talking about sort of like stereotyping. Um, so good, beware the stereotyping. But I'm gonna give you a quantitative reason why you should beware the stereotyping. Okay, so if we're using the representativeness heuristic, and these are our five choices, the characteristics that are described for Rudy makes it seem like he might be a trapeze artist. I mean, his wife's a performer, right? Um, he has tattoos on his body, which is not very uncommon, right? But whatever. He likes 78 RPM records. He takes yoga classes. He's outgoing and boisterous. I mean, it sounds like he's willing to take dares. I mean, kind of sounds like he's probably out of these choices the things that he has in, you know, as part of his uh, description match up with trapeze artists better than anything else. So you wouldn't be wrong for having that come into your mind first, but let's talk about why quantitatively we should not fall for trapeze artists. First off, let's just go through what we call the base rate of these different jobs. So there are about 2.6 million farmers in the country. There are about 30, 366,000 librarians, 1.35 million lawyers, 950,000 doctors. Um, I searched the um, ONET, which is a compilation of all sorts of um, professions in the nation, and um, there's not even a separate profession called trapeze artists. There are so few of them. They're lumped together with um, performers, um, uh, artists, uh, magicians like they're all lumped together into one big category so i can't even tell you specifically how many trapeze artists there are in the country um, because it's not a separate job spec so i'm going to say rare right i'm going to say there are way fewer than 366,000, like there are with the librarians right maybe it's a tenth of that or maybe even a hundredth of the number of of librarians people who make a career um, as an occupation, being a trapeze artist. So you would be more likely to be correct picking any one of the other, any one of the other jobs than picking trapeze artist, just base rate, right? There are more librarians in the country than there are trapeze artists. There are more farmers, lawyers, doctors than there are trapeze artists. So just, it doesn't even matter what you say, the characteristics of Rudy are, your best bet would be to say he's a farmer. Like that would be the, no matter what you say about him, no matter what characteristics he has, who cares, the best, the most probable profession is farmer because that's the most common profession of the ones that you were given as choices. I hope that makes sense, right? We need to look at the base rate of these professions in order to make a quantitative, like logical judgment. So it doesn't matter how well he, he represents any of these professions, what matters is the base rate. I pulled down the, I got frustrated that I couldn't find just um, trapeze artists and stuff. So I even went on to the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics and I was able to find this entry um, and they're lumped together with artist performers and related workers. So I have no idea how many, and see all the things that are under there. It includes hypnotists, including excluding the medical ones, Ventriloquists, magicians, fortune tellers, stunt persons, and clowns. So they're like, there's a lot, wide variety of people who could be lumped into this one category that 
would include trapeze artists. So I'm not exactly sure how many there are, but I'm just going to say not that many. I'm going to be, I'm going to go with farmer. Rudy's a farmer. He might like 70, 78 RPM records. He may have tattoos and take yoga classes. It doesn't matter. His wife might, might be a performer. What's that even mean? She might be a singer. She might be a dancer. Who knows what she is, right? I'm going to go with farmer. That is statistically my best chance of being correct. I don't want to succumb to the base rate fallacy where I say this person so closely represents my prototype that I'm going to ignore the base rate of this occupation in the in the population. I'm going to focus on the numbers and I'm going to say I think he's a farmer. I don't know Rudy. I got this description of Rudy from someone else, so I don't know him, but I'm going to go he's a farmer. Statistically I'm most if he's not a farmer, he's a lawyer. Right? Those are my two guesses. That's and I'm sticking with it. All right, how about framing when we're dealing with a problem? So here's a study that was reported in a book. A um, hundred students of the author of the book were asked to choose a subscription to The Economist. Apparently the magazine The Economist um, does this every year trying to boost um, subscriptions. And they do two different ways of um, you know, trying to get people to sign up. So here we have the print plus digital for $125 or digital only for $59. Okay. So 68 of the 100 students selected the digital only and 32 selected the print plus digital. Um, and that led to a total revenue of $8,000 basically for the economist using this setup where you have two to choose from. Then they have their periodic sort of sale. And so the, the author said, now we have a sale and you can still get your print for 125 and you can still get your digital for 59, but now we have print plus digital as an option for 125. For, so for the same price as print alone, you also will get access to the digital content. So with this kind of setup, we are now going to call that print one a decoy because who in their right mind would pick just the print when you could get print plus digital, right? So by having it there, no one picked it, but 84 students were willing to pay $125 for this content when on the previous setup, when it had just been head to head print versus digital, nobody was willing to pay $125 for this subscription. But now that they're getting print plus digital, compared to just print alone, that sounds like quite the deal, right? So now we've increased our revenues by about $3,000 by putting in print as a decoy when the choices really are between print plus digital and digital, because it doesn't cost the economist anything to give a print subscriber also access to the digital, right? It costs them nothing. Um, so by putting that print in there as a decoy, they can boost the likelihood that people will actually pick the print plus digital because now they're making the comparison between print and print plus digital as opposed to what they had been doing on the previous slide, which was making the comparison between print and digital. So by framing it as look at this great deal, you're getting print and digital access, whereas all you're getting is digital over here on the right. Oh gosh, the print plus digital sounds like a deal. So by framing the question in the right way, you can get people to make the selection that you want them to make. So framing is literally like you're putting a frame around the problem and getting the participant or the, the decision maker to only focus on that part of the information that you want them to focus on. Okay, just only look right here, right? I want you to pay attention to this. Um, so that's why it's called framing. All right, now this is an old classic study by Tversky and Kahneman, and um, they provided people with, um, in decision one, two choices. So you either get a sure gain of $240. So that's code for saying, I will give you $240. Or you can gamble. You have a 25% chance of winning $1,000 and a 75% chance of winning nothing. You've seen this on game shows. I watch, I've watch. i been watching a lot of cab, cash cab over the break. And so one of the things that they'll do is they'll win their money as the cash cab is driving around town and stuff. They get to their destination and then they're always confronted with the option of, okay, so here's all the money that you've won so far. I will give it to you. Or you can do this video question and if you win it, then I will double whatever you have in your hand. 
what you find is that a lot of people are unwilling to take that chance. Most people will pick A. Most people will take the sure gain. And most people in the cash cab take their money and they run. Um, because they know that there's a chance that they're going to lose that money that they had acquired. Now, one of the things that Tversky and Kahneman pointed out is that a 25% chance of winning a thousand and a 75% chance of winning nothing averages out over the long run to being the same as winning $250, right? Like if you have a 25% chance of winning a thousand, that's 25% of a thousand is $250, right? So over the long run, if you got to play this game like a hundred times, you'd ultimately, through the wins and the losses, end up with $250. But we don't get to play it over a hundred times, do we? We get to, we have to make a choice right now. And so, and it, there's nothing in here that implies that that 25% chance is over the long run. It sounds like it's a one-time deal. So it's not surprising that most people pick the sure gain of $250. Then they follow up with um, decision two. And now with decision two, they have to choose between a sure loss of $750, which is code for give me $750, <laughs> um, or they get to gamble. And they have a 75% a chance of losing $1,000 and a 25% chance of losing nothing. So in this scenario, I'm sure that you can imagine that the average participant is like, I'm focusing in on this 25% chance of losing nothing. I'm going to go with the gamble. So what Tversky and Kahneman were trying to figure out is, again, statistically, if you average across like 100 trials, you're, you're looking at another $250. Like really in decision one and two, it's really the same basic decision, just sort of inverted. And they were really trying to figure out why in decision one, people go with the sure gain, and then in decision two, they go with the gamble. And what they concluded is that people are displaying loss aversion. Like once I have this sure gain, like that's a possibility that I could do nothing and, and I just have 250 more dollars than I started off with. Once they have that in their mind, the idea of like potentially not winning anything really is painful. Whereas with decision two, okay, I have to give you money that I already have, or I can gamble for the chance of not losing anything. I'm willing to take that gamble. What Tversky says is that losses loom larger than corresponding gains. You know, they had done all this statistics about really these are the same problems and how come the decision maker can't see them as the same problem. And they were trying to rationalize it all out. And what they ultimately re realize is that people are loss averse. If they, if they have a bird in the hand, they don't need it flying into the bush. They want to keep what they have. They don't want to lose what they have. Um, okay, so that has a nice lead in into this next problem. You've just handed in a difficult exam. You'll know the day after tomorrow whether you passed or failed. You're offered a real bargain in the form of a vacation in Hawaii for less than $200 but you have to decide by tomorrow and hand in a non-reimbursable deposit of $50. You can put off the decision for a day, by which time you will know for sure whether you passed or failed, for an additional $15, which is neither reimbursable nor deducted from the total price of your package. What do you decide to do? My son's a student and I was creating my beautiful slide yesterday with my split screen and everything, and so I read the question out loud to him and he did what most of my students do. He's like hesitated for a second. And then he said, wait a minute, what does the exam have to do with whether I'm going to Hawaii or not? That beat where he was trying to decide what the correct solution um, was, he was considering, do I wanna pay $15 so I can wait? If it crossed your mind even for a second, do I wanna pay $15 so I can wait and find out? You're displaying what Tversky and Shafir call irrational prudence. Um, they also call it the disjunction effect. Um, the idea is that sometimes we will make, we will defer a decision even at our own peril. Like I might waste $15 and in the context of a $200 trip, $15 is a substantial proportion of that, right? It's seven and a half percent of the total price of the trip. 
Like, why would I give you $15 just so I can de de delay the decision for a day? And one of the things that, as you ha um, hear the people working it out in the Tversky study, um, they're like, well, I mean, I guess if I, is there anything that says I could make up the test? And if I'm out of town, I'd miss my chance? No, there's nothing like that in there. Well, I guess if I find out that I failed the test, I'll be glad I'm in Hawaii because I can console myself. <laughs> and if I find out that I passed the test, then I can say, yay, I'm glad I'm in Hawaii to celebrate that I am done with that class, right? Like, what's the difference? How you did on the test, either way, it makes sense to be in Hawaii when you find out the results, right? But there's that beat where we go, maybe I should wait. People do it all the time. They'll find the perfect home for themselves. And they'll be like, wow, this is at a great price. It's right where I want to live. Everything looks right. And their realtor will say, do you want to put in an offer? And they're like, well, let's wait a second. Let us talk about it. And they'll miss out on the house. Or the next thing you know, there's a, a bidding war and they're paying more for the house than they wanted. Um, things like that. We, we oftentimes will display this irrational, like it doesn't make sense, prudence. Like I'm just trying to be careful. Like I don't want to make a bad decision. My mom did that when she moved back from Mexico and she needed to get American car insurance. And so we found her a really good deal through a, a retirement group and everything. And she's like, wow, that's actually less than I thought it would be. Well, I'm going to think about it. I'm like, what is there to think about? We've already done all the research. What are you thinking about? And she goes, well, I mean, I know it's like a six month commitment if I do. And I'm like, mom, if you think it's a good price and we've done all the research, what are you waiting for? And she was displaying that irrational prudence. She's like, well, I don't know. I, maybe I should defer. Maybe I should wait. Really common in everyday life to see ourselves making those kinds of, um, I would say in the long run, oftentimes bad decisions where we put it off and now we've actually got a physical cost from having put off the decision. In the case of this example, we, we lost $15 so we could have more time. Um, you know, in the house in case of buying a house, you know, maybe the, we've lost the house or it's gone up in price or, you know, like a lot of times we will actually harm ourselves with our irrational prudence. All right, let's summarize all this stuff I've been going over. I tried to, I tried to sort of cluster things under headers to make it make a little bit more sense. So under the overall header of thinking errors, we have the projective way of knowing, right? And there was the principle of humanity and the illusion of simplicity. And then we have the anchoring effect, the sunk cost fallacy. They're sort of individual things. Um, then we have the different heuristics where um, we have the availability and the representativeness heuristics. And then we have the base rate fallacy and the framing effect where we have the decoy effect and the loss aversion and the irrational prudence. Um, so all of these are different kinds of thinking errors that can all contribute to us focusing on the wrong parts of information, um, you know, expecting the wrong things out of, um, you know, scenarios, uh, wrong things out of people, things like that. So I just wanted to summarize it all there for you. And then I wanted to finish by apparently having a poorly animated slide here. I wanted to finish it. My conclusion is that if you combine all those thinking errors and framing and, and then the first thing I talked about, you know, write those distraction by miracles and stuff like that, it can really contribute to errors in probabilistic reasoning. And what that means is that uh, we can fear the wrong things. We think that things that are really rare are actually going to get us. Um, they can cause us to ignore important facts so that we draw incorrect conclusions in the long run. And then, of course, my personal uh, favorite thing to always bring up is pseudoscience. You thought I was going to go an entire chapter without phrasing the um, pseudoscience, but right, if we don't really understand how things work, if we don't, you know, if we if we display these thinking errors and and get distracted by miracles, we're much more vulnerable to believing pseudoscientific claims than if we are able to root our decisions and our thinking in probabilistic reasoning. All right, that concludes this chapter. So I will see you guys in the next chapter.